Bwana asifiwe. We can have our seats. You have prayed, you have sung. So let me do what I'm called to do and that is to share the word of God. Romans chapter number 12 uh, beginning from verse 1. This is what I've been sharing in the word of the week and I just feel it's good we build on this matter. I just want to talk about the power of a transformed mind. The power of a transformed mind. The mind is a very powerful gadget and a very powerful tool in the life of a human being. What you need to understand that man is a triune being. Triune simply means you are an existing trinity. That means you are three in one. You have a body, you have a soul, and you have a spirit. That's what we mean as a triune being. Are we together? So you have a body, you have a soul, and you have a, a spirit. And the body level is what we see externally. And when we go to the story of creation, we realize that God created man. And that man was a spirit man because he was in the image of God. So that man was a spirit. Then we come now to Genesis 2. And then we see God forming man. So there is a created man and there is a formed man. Because to create is to bring into existence out of nothing. To create. That's why we have creatives. Musicians are called creatives. They bring things into existence out of nothing. But to form is when you use something to bring something. So he created a spirit out of nothing, but he formed the body out of the clay. So you have a dimension that was created and you have a dimension that is formed. Are you getting me? That's why scripture said before I formed thee, I knew thee because you are faster spirit and then now you came as a form. Thank you, Pastor Jimmy. You came as a form. But after God formed the man, we see that God now breathed into his nostril the breath of life and man became a living being. Some versions say they are a living soul. So, so when we begin to look at this man, uh, maybe I don't know if it's NIV that talks about a living soul. Or it's the original KJV. One of them uh, talks about and man became a living soul. Uh, so, so now we, we are now dealing with a form. The Lord God formed man of the dust. And, and breathed into that man. That name breathe. The Hebrew word there is ruach. That name ruach means spirit. So the ruach of God came and deposited soul. Uh, may, may God give you understanding. Are we together? Now, the, 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 the original man before sin carried a soul that was not defiled. That soul there, uh, I, I've spoken about this, but there is no problem in repetition. The soul can be divided into three. There is the first component of the soul has logic, that's where reasoning happens. It has seat of emotions and it has will. That's the first component of the soul. I, I know you go soul winning. Now let me tell you what you win. <laughs> that's what you win. You begin to win the logic, that's why you preach. You have to allow the Holy Spirit to interfere with the emotions and then the will of that person will now be aligned and conform to the will of God. That's why you can never win souls by dancing. You must preach. How will they know? Unless they hear the word. And then the same soul has consciousness, subconscious, and memory. The same soul. It has conscious, subconscious, and memory. Right now, you are conscious of what is happening. And that's why if I stare at you for long, you will blink. Why? You are conscious of this moment. But tomorrow, this moment will be captured in your memory faculty. 
Uh, as you begin to sleep in this service, you are moving from the consciousness of the service and you are entering into the subconscious. You can hear my voice, but you are not fully conscious of the moment. You know the way you write and then you realize it's like you're writing a signature and then now you realize, oh, where did I stop? Now you come back to the consciousness of that moment. That is still a part of your soul. And your soul also has the five senses. The sense of touch, the sense of seeing, the sense of hearing, the sense of taste, and uh, the sense of smell. Those senses are a component of your soul. Okay? That is why when your soul leaves the body, we, we talk of that as death. And whatever connects your soul with the body is called a silver cord. The only man that explains about the silver cord is Solomon. There, there is a cord that can be broken. And the mystery of your soul is that there is a distance your soul can journey out of your body. That is what witches are trained out of body experience. But when they go beyond the levels of the silver cord and it is cut, now that becomes a roaming spirit. And that roaming spirit can be used for demonic assignment. Until now, the day of the death of that person. Okay, am I speaking too much? Because everyone, it's appointed for a man to be born and a man to die. So when you exercise out of body experiences and you break the silver cord before the day that you are meant to die, then it means that spirit is legally on earth but illegal because it's not in a body. And now such a spirit can be used for demonic activities. Or when you go to our grandfathers, you always hear Mababu and Itaji Blanketi. And sometimes they say, we must stay here until the soul. So this man, there's something they know. Matters of the spirit are not biology. <laughs> they, they can be decoded in that realm. And so now, that, that is the, 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 the component of the soul. And, and, and we need to get this very clearly. Um, when, when your soul leaves the body and the silver cord is broken, we automatically declare you dead. And at that time, your eyes cannot see, your ears cannot hear, your nose cannot smell, your tongue cannot taste, neither can you feel anything. Though you have eyes, but you cannot see. Though you have ears, but you cannot hear. Though you have a nose, but you cannot smell. Though you have a tongue, but you cannot taste. Why? Because the potency is in the soul. The ability to see is in the soul. It's not the eyeballs that see. It is the soul that gives the eyeball power to see. You see, when you take a bulb and put it in a place where there is no current, it cannot light up. Because what makes the bulb light up is electricity. Are you getting it? What makes your eyes see is the soul. That's why when you lose your soul, or when your soul leaves the body, now we are left with flesh and gadgets that are there as monuments. They can't do anything. And that's why there is a level, even in prayer, now when you begin to understand lectures on healing, there is a level whereby you are trained to open the gates of the eye. Because they can be open. The language of blindness is that there are gates that have been locked. And so there is a level of prayer whereby you can be trained to open the gates of the eye and you open the eyes of the blind. And that's why it's also possible for a man to bewitch you and arrest your sight. Because there is a gate. The, the eyes are called a gate. That's why the Bible says in Matthew, when your eyes are exposed to light, it's a gate. The whole body will be full of light. But when your eyes are exposed to darkness, the whole body, why? Because it's a, it's a gate. And that's how people now release insanity and that's how they release blindness and that's how they can even sometimes cause things to happen in your life they, they begin to tamper with the gates of your soul and and they and they, at that level now they mismanage because the soul ought to govern your life now you begin to see here that the bread that came upon the first man was a fresh breath before adam sinned he bore a fresh breath Meaning that he had purity of logic, purity of emotions, purity of will, purity of memory, purity of consciousness, purity of the subconscious, 
And everything upon his life was in a perfected mode. And that begins to tell you, this man, because the mind, the mind is a part of the soul. That, that, that whatever we call the mind, the brains, the processor of logics and the processor of judgments, verdicts, temperaments, that thing is a part of the soul. The, the, the one that measures rationality is a part of the soul. And that this is what makes you different from animals, by the way. Animals have elements of a soul, but they don't have a complement of a soul. They can feel, but they cannot reason. You, you watch National Geographic, a monkey dies and the mother feels. You can even see animals feeling bad. That's why even in the law of agriculture, you're not supposed to slaughter a goat in the presence of other goats. You are affecting the emotions of those goats. Now you see you are laughing. They have emotions. Now, now this is what now makes man to some level superior. And that's why when man is moved from engaging from his logical processor, that man becomes inferior more than what he's supposed to rule. Let me give you a good example. When you look at the whole LGBTQ campaign, they never say do what you think. They say do what you feel. Even when you go to comments, people will always say, let people do what they... Now remember, man is not an emotional being. Man is a rational being. When you move man from rational to emotion, that man will be lower than animals that are not logical. And that's why you never find a gay chicken. And they are not rational. So you, you can imagine, when you put the jungle in the concept of morality... Wild animals have more moral values than men that have logic and rationale. And the best way is to suppress the rationale and to lift emotion. That's why when this emotional question shows up, we become, they are called sissies, not warriors. You respond everything with what you feel, not what you know. And I can tell you, I know life is hard, but I also believe when we took our heads out of matters and emotions took over, that's why we are committing suicide, the way we are doing. You don't respond to life with what you feel. You must respond to life with what you know. Because you are rational, you are logical. And that's why there is a level of gospel preaching which is called sensational. That sensational, it's an emotional exciting gospel. It does not change the mind, it excites the heart. Hallelujah. You come, you lift your chairs. You, we are just whipping your emotions. And once the milk settles, you discover it was a form level of rising. Now you face the reality of your level. <laughs> Okay, let's talk. But there is a gospel that changes how you view life. If the gospel does not change your mind, then whatever you are listening to is motivational teachings. And motivational teachers just excite for a moment. But when reality comes, is when you understand you never learn swimming by watching TV. You can try. We can teach you backstroke and front strokes and how to flap the waters. But the day you get in the water, you'll discover there is a force that pushes you down, which you can't experience in lectures. You only experience when you jump. You discover that there is a coldness in water that as your water reaches the legs, the whole body reacts and you forget the lectures. The first, there's a guy who learned swimming. The first day, Alingia kwa swimmo, alisema kuna mashetani, zilikuwa zinamvuta. Na kasemi yo swimming pool ni ate worshipa. How come you, you know, it's centrifugal force. Something was, so that's why you have to float. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, uh, because the reason why I'm building this matter is for us to understand that the first man had a supernatural mind. Adam. That man had a supernatural mind. How can God entrust you with what is Two branches of academia 
and men have not exhausted. That God can entrust you with botanical science and zoological science. You name everything. And there are still species or species <laughs> of animals that we are discovering. But I want to believe Abdam named them. And whatever he named, God never questioned. Because there was potency to run that activity. When you hear the word on the seventh day, God rested. The word there is not that God went on holiday. It means now God found someone that he could delegate the affairs of the earth. You see, if, if, I, if, if by the grace of God, I, I find pastors and they are there by the way, and I know that I don't need even to come on Sunday and I can do other things, I have rested from life church. Okay? Because I know service will go on, people will still come, the church will grow whether I'm there or not. So I delegate and say, you guys are in charge. And I enter what? Rest. That means I know the church is running. That's exactly what it means. That now God had raised a man with the potency to rule the earth. But this man needed a supernatural mind. That's why he was told, whatever you name, that's it, it shall be so. And so when he went around just calling things, now you can look at the supernatural memory. He sees an elephant and remembered he called it elephant and he never called it Morothi. You know, it's amazing. All these animals. One day I went to, to Masai Mara. I'd even forgotten. The, we met some, just the anniversary, you find birds. You are told, I don't know this one is which one. By the time the day is done, you can't even remember which one was each one. Because again, sin reduced the memory space of our mind. So this man had a supernatural mind. But when sin entered, it corrupted that dimension. And let me tell you, by the way, as a matter of fact, your, your, your potential of creativity is so big if only you focus on one thing. You can't focus on TikTok and focus on business. Your mind is conditioned to operate on certain dimensions. That's why some of us, our minds are too busy but occupied with the wrong products. It's like having a 10 GB flash disk but 8 GB is full of movies and 1 GB is full of assignment. Now the potential of that flash disk is not being fully maximized if it was supposed to carry notes. Too much junk occupied by things that cannot change your life. I got late because I was making my home library. They say the soul of a house is if that house has a library. That is the life of a house. If you have no books in your house, that's a cave. And good books. <laughs> now you see you're not saying amen. So you are cavemen. Hallelujah. Because when man fell, he lost the, 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 the capacity and the potency of his mind. Something just left him. And so he, he began to operate on a limited space. But in scripture, we see patterns of men that pursued righteousness and began to touch levels of creativity that were supernatural. Number one is Joseph. Joseph. By the way, there is a part of your creativity mind that is connected to your purity sexually. I am posing so that you can think of it. I've discovered even out of just interaction, I'll meet some people and they'll tell me, Pastor, from the time I began to masturbate, my grades went down. Because there are energies transmitted from your mind, they are lost at that level. And those energies would have been used for another thing, solutions. But now at that time, that energy is wasted on something different. There was a man doing scientific research just to show intelligence and the connection of intelligence with masturbation and how intelligence men can lose their, their level of creativity because of masturbation. Joseph observed what? Sexual P. 
impurity. Okay? And he said, how can I do such a thing against my God? Because he understood the omnipresence nature of God. You look at the life of Joseph. The scriptures are very clear. Whatever he presented to Egypt was a proposal. That's what the Bible says. There was a dream. There was seven years of famine. Seven years of harvest. And then he was called to interpret the dream. But he didn't just interpret the dream. He brought a proposal that healed Egypt in time of crisis. And whatever gave him a position as the second in command in Egypt was the proposal he gave, not prayer. I sat with a, with a professor and he's born again, he's an elder. Uh, we were in a meeting somewhere. And he's an elder in church and I asked him, how can we improve our economy as a nation? And he said, sir, great nations, because I spoke about Samson fought for his eyes. He said, Lord, just this one time so that I can avenge for my eyes. And I was asking, so the man never even fought for his hair. He realized that power without vision is useless. The man was revenging because they took away his eyes. And he told me, sir, what caught my attention in your preaching was eyes. He said, the problem of nations is not prayer, is vision. I asked him, what do you mean? He said, a, a good example, Belgium goes for referendum. Not to vote so that we can have prime minister. No, that is not their issue. They develop a 25-year economic plan, vision. And they share it and share the concept of how the vision will be implemented. And then the people vote it. So whoever becomes president does not need to introduce new things. He's like a CEO managing the economic model. And he said, do you know who did that in Kenya? I said, no. He said, it was Kibaki when he introduced vision 2030. It was an um, economic vision separated from politics. So that yes, you become the president, okay, but you are implementing this vision. Now that thing was thrown away. I looked at him, I said, these are the brains we need. As intercessors pray. <laughs> there are men that have supernatural mind. And I sat down with him, I said, you know, I'm a pastor. But I think every church is building churches. I mean schools. As a way of um, raising a, a extra revenue. I said, there is no way in the Bible written that the work of the church is to build schools. I said, as a church, why can't we come to a place and open a factory? Because we are looking at extra revenue to do what? The gospel. He said, now you are thinking. He said, there is something called the motor economy. What am jengo? He said, it takes between 12 to 18 years to recover your money when you put it in a building. But when you put an industry, it takes three months to recover your money. Hi. I said, Lord, listen, that man never spoke in tongues. We were talking of a cup of tea. There is a level of thinking we must enter. And God has given us functional brains. Joseph shows up. Sees a vision. Seven years of drought. Seven years of plenty. It is revealed. And the king believes that's it. The man does not just give an interpretation and say, you know, I'm always anointed. Anytime king, you have a dream, just call me. This is my number. No. He said, king. This is the dream and this is the meaning. But after the meaning, if I were you, these seven years, I would have built a storage area. Save and allow all the people to bring their wheat there. So that when the seven years come, they can come and buy from the government collection center. And the economy of Egypt will continue while the economy of other states collapse. And the king listened and asked the men, who, who can implement this proposal other than the give of the proposal? Listen, creative minds speak solutions. Excuses are like clutches and every cripple has to. And it is in the intensity of crisis that creativity thrives. There is a level where we call it intellectual laziness, where people don't want to think. Listen, we can never think on your behalf. Hey. 
Someone said some people kichwa ni kama ya separate masikio. Hai, okay. Nimeongea <laughs> vibaya. Hapana hiyo hizi kwa yako. We used to say wacha kutumia kichwa kama kofia. Tumia kichwa ku fikiria si kitu tu livaa asubuhi. Ah. <laughs> Tell your neighbor proposals. Are you getting that language? A proposal is a solution. And and someone told me when covid became a disaster and it was declared as a disaster someone told me when it moved from a pandemic to a disaster that one now became business <laughs> because in that crisis now people began to ask how do we mitigate how do we mitigate this disaster now there are people praying there are people thinking another time there are people who are importing masks while others were saying Psalms 91 <laughs> it cannot come near me and then they go and buy masks from men that were <laughs> thinking i don't know someone came and sold me a mask it was plastic and the only thing i needed to change was them was the what, what it was it was just something i needed to change and it was cheap and and she was like this mask is a thousand but you buy it you don't need to buy another mask you just need to change this towel inside and these towels uh this packet of a hundred has almost i don't know how many pieces and i felt like wow and i and i i bought two, one for my wife and she told me this is our idea i say these are the men <laughs> Now the advantage of being a pastor you you dedicate and you get free samples so i got one and one for my wife bona si fiwe this is my point guys we will speak in tongues but after saying amen we must sit down and begin now to engage our minds over matters you must have a book where you write and write you agree and disagree you argue with yourself you must have a book where you have plan a plan b plan c and you are forever executing you are forever planning i tell you they say even in scientifically man has not utilized 10% of his brain function 10% it's unutilized and do you know what is happening is because when we were born we were conditioned when when I went to GSU they told me that when you enter there you unaingianga kama raia. Na na ukiingia unakuambia raia pari unasema mzuri. And then they know now there is a training called conditioning theory. They told me there are two theories. There is conditioning theory and there is brainwashing theory. Now terrorists apply the brainwashing theory. So that you can go kill yourself, you don't think. You are now manipulated. But police they, they are and military they apply conditioning theory they have to take away your uraia and put in u policy <laughs> ronnie is here ronnie was telling us when he went for the training six months one of the things is that when you enter the first thing they train you is to say yes sir so he entered a cambio bariako asema mzuri akambio kwanza beba your box your kichwa now kiambi ubebo nasema yes sir so the one orientation was yes sir so when they come and they say good morning you wake up and say yes sir so he told me after six months he went home and the mom called him ronnie he woke up and said yes sir then he went, ah, niko home. <laughs> why because the mind has been conditioned to operate on a certain level are you getting it and and conditioning theory is now and, and they told me six months later they will still call the man raya and the man will get so mad because he has gone through so much training to take away the raya. The first thing is raya kuna vile wanava. The second kuna vile raya wananyoa. The third kuna vile raya wanaoparate. Now there you enter into a program. 
and you can't shave the way you are shaving. You can't walk. This is how police walk. And so they have to take it. And now when they call you Raya, you are like, no. The training I've gone through, I cannot be a Raya. And I said, maybe Paul knew something when he said, See, soldiers are not involved in civilian affairs. There must be a conditioning that you are not just another believer. You are born again. God is in you. And you begin now to live as a carrier of Christ and refuse to live as an unbeliever. Hallelujah. So this is, this is, Joseph, supernaturally, the man gives a solution. The only thing the king gave him were two. Number one, he gave him his signet ring. That was like Mikael Kupewa Penya president. That whatever you pass in Egypt is passed. He was, the king said, the only thing I can give you is my throne. But I want to tell you, the king was a ceremonious king. The man that was running Egypt was Joseph. That was the man. And they say in ancient times, kings entrusted strangers with power because they could not overthrow them. That's why Daniel ruled in Nebuchadnezzar's time. Because they knew this is a foreigner, he can't overthrow me. And so they gave him power. So the work of the king was just to receive reports how the kingdom was doing. And the kingdom was doing well that the whole world entered into crisis. And guess what? It was Egypt that had wheat only. Because a man came with a solution. Not tongues solution. Divine. And that solution earned him a position. Hallelujah. Please, let me help you. Because not all of us are going to open our own businesses. The day you'll get employed and you sit in a board meeting, please, survive with your mouth. I remember there's a lady we used to work with. She was the laziest in the company. Laziest. But before we went to any meeting, she used to read all our reports. Well, the guys in the field. So she used to read all our reports. And then she was the loudest in the board meeting where CEOs are seated. So I remember one day she shared a story that I had written. And then I could realize Hannah content. <laughs> because now we're supposed to do a report and do a success story. So because we're doing some HIV testing and all that, so we found a guy who was positive and the guy was very positive even to respond to drugs, medication, and we began to follow up. So I just wrote and said, you know, this program is helping. And, 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 and now in the boardroom she had read my report. And she began to say, you know, the organization is doing well. We, we are, we, 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 the word is we. The guy, we, we are so, do, you know, a lot of feedback. And in fact, there was this guy, I can't remember the name. I'm like, hey, this guy, I can't remember the name uh, from this school. He, he, he tested positive and he was, the attitude was very positive. Well, let me ask my friend to help me. And I'm the, I'm the one who was in the field. And you know what the CEO said? You know, so and so, you look so passionate about this work. And we're like, who? This is the one who sleeps in the office. And I discovered some of us are too humble and our jobs are being hijacked. There are places you talk. You say, sir, what about one, two, three? And by that time, you are, you are sharing decisions. Hallelujah. This is what promoted Joseph to the place of relevance. Hi. May God give you wisdom. Yes. As he has said, I second that. That's the only, that's, that, in fact, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you, sir, for saying it on my behalf. And you continue with the meeting, and they see this guy is thinking. Do you have anything to say? No, sir. Hey, no. When a fool is quiet in the company of wise men, he looks wise. <laughs> Daniel operated on that level, 10 times wiser. Because he refused to defile himself. He carried wisdom, intelligence of the realm of the spirit. Because the king of Babylon survived on that intelligence. And the man served in three governments. Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar and Dairas. He served for 65 years. 65. And well, yesterday when I was doing the Bible study. When they threw him in the den of lions. Is because the king Dairas wanted to make Daniel the leader of leaders. So they became jealous. And they said, let no man serve their God in this territory. 
The man, and the Bible says, the man had an excellent spirit. And the man was faithful to what he was doing. Hey, what work you do though? There are places you'll be fired not because you are not worthy, but because you don't have an excellent spirit. Today is 28th. People are meant to deliver reports on 26th. This is the time you are delivering a report. On 26th, you sent a report where you never attached anything. And we know your works. And you said, find attached regards. And then now you want to send tonight and say, sorry, I forgot to attach. And you know you are lying. And then you hear the company is downsizing. And you come with a seed of preservation of the work. And the Lord is saying, you have never been faithful. You use office Wi-Fi to listen to Bible study when men are working. It looks spiritual, but you're not faithful. You think Daniel was using office Wi-Fi? <laughs> are we having a church? Bonus for Sana. You know, you know, one of the things we must raise a balance because I, I, yesterday I was talking to an apostle and he told me, prayer without evangelism is like shooting an arrow without a target. I said, as a pastor, the more we pray, we must go out and evangelize. Are you getting it? Now, some of you, the more you pray, you must go out and act. Yes, wherever you are. Daniel, 10 times wiser. That wisdom preserved him. Now, let's go to the text in five minutes and then now we, we can go home. Are you learning something? Are you learning something? Yes. I've discovered the greatest veil is the veil of the mind. You can never go further than your thoughts. We can wish you well, but if you have the veil of the mind, you can't go further than that. And the word of God has the power to take away the veil of the mind. What is that veil? It is how you view yourself, not how we view you. One day, I, um, I was getting into where I used to work. I won't mention the name of the place. And I remember I'd, I'd left my car inside. And I was a young boy. And I think I was wondering, how is this young boy driving? And I found a man, the gatekeeper at the gate. And I told him, sir, my car is inside. My shopping is inside. I want to pick the car. He said, According to this book, when I received the handover, they say there is no car coming out. It's past the hour. I said, then walk me to the car. Let me get my house keys. Then I go and leave the car. I'll get it tomorrow. I can get a matatu. There's still time. The man now began to tell me, I said, I have not even said that ujasoma. Now, have you ever realized there are people, they express how they view themselves and they make you look like that's how you view them. We're just asking if you're ready for serious re relationship. Okay, now you see. <laughs> that begins to tell me how you view your self. And that's the veil of the mind. Let me ask you, are there things that you look at and you feel there are people who deserve them and not you? Let's talk. Yeah, kuna vitu tu. I remember when I was in high school, kuna watu tulikuwa najua hawa ndo wanafaa kuwa number one. Sisi, toko sawa kungangani hapa nyu, but number one ni hawa. That's a veil of the mind. And that thing has to be lifted. And some of that is because of how we grew up. We were conditioned. I remember I mentioned this on service the other day. One of the tragedies of African parenting is that we grew hearing what not to do, but we never grew hearing what to do. So we, we grew fearing to try things. And, and so that, that creativity element in the mind was silenced. Your mom was always on your case when you did something wrong. But when you tried something, they never applauded you. And some of us, we are victims of being discouraged by the very people who ought to have spoken courage. You told your mom, you know, one day I landed in America. And she laughed for 30 minutes. Saying, you. Hey. <laughs> what, 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 
Nairobi umefika uniambia America. And you see that voice killed that desire. Are you getting it? And and some of us have been trapped in the veils of our minds and we have reached a place of accepting that this is all life can offer. You have been conditioned to be comfortable at the place where men begin. And that's why one of the things that the word of God begins to do in your mind it begins to take away the veil and the word begins to condition you in a different way. There is a formatting that happens. That's why you must love to read the word and invest in books. There is a, there is a formatting and a conditioning. That's what we call a mindset. Something must set your mind. What sets that mind is information. It gives you a set and that set of mind dictates how you view things, perceive things, analyze and judge things. I've discovered every man that writes a book has a secret that is so unique. That's why every time I'm reading a book, I always know I will see something that I've never seen. I spend a lot in books but I spend a lot in the Bible. There is a conditioning of the mind. There is a deliverance of the mind. There are things that God cannot speak to you because your mind is conditioned to a certain level. Hallelujah. And it, the, the word of God is light. It's illumination. It begins to kill possibilities and impossibilities and brings them down. Reading. Someone told me, there is the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain. And they said, and this was a psychiatrist and the, the person told me, I have seen three cases of insane people that became sane by hearing the read, read, reading of the word. Hearing. It begins to affect the right side of the mind where creativity and depression attacks. Reading the word. These are not letters and literatures. Jesus said this is life. And this is light. That's why we, we must be intentional. Hallelujah. Let me tell you some of the things I do. It's only that now when children came, sometimes you, you when children come, they change your life. Whether you want or not. But what I used to do is they are, they are, they are, what do we call? They are, they are messages I used to listen to around 10 minutes. Just called morning inspirations. And that's what I used to, every day I began to feed my mind with there are no impossibilities in life. You can push further than where you are. That became what I began to hear. And it began to, fall, to shape a mindset. I don't know what you hear in the morning. Every devil that stops your life, I declare thunder. You wake up now knowing devils. No, no. I'm not seeing you. <laughs> the spirit of rejection, the spirit of opposition. You know, I tell you, and by the way, they are there. I'm not saying they're not there. But there is another sound. I, I know, I know. People like Joel Austin, they are not too deep. They have no mysteries. But at that morning, when your mind is loading, sometimes you just need to hear, you know, it doesn't matter what you're going through. There is a God in heaven. Get out of that bed and tell yourself this shall be a good day. Hey, you can't sleep in warfare and wake in warfare. You sleep binding and you wake up binding. I ah, know. <laughs> ah, brother. No, and I tell you that there is power. There is power. There's a preacher I was listening to. And I discovered every time I listen to it, my spirit will be troubled. Because we, he, there, there's nothing positive used to talk. Everything is criticizing. No, what is this now? What is this now? What is this now? No, I was wondering, okay, no, which one is the good one? Until I said, uh, okay, I need someone that can tell me what I need to do. Not what, what, yes, seven signs to know why you are poor. Okay, I'm poor. So what do I do from my poverty now? 
Oh, you've called me seven. Hey, I see them. I can't pay rent. Now, what are the seven signs of getting out? You can't live in that condition mindset. There must be something that begins to trigger you for more action and activities in life. And I, and I, and I began to condition my mind. These, these were not the deep mysteries. My time for mysteries is midnight. But that time was just sounds that provoked me. And, and you know, there were, there were amazing quotes. Nini. And, and, and I remember... One day I just listened to a guy who is not even born again. And, and it was Muhammad Ali. Ali. And he was asked. And they were saying, Muhammad Ali was asked, how many press-ups do you do in a day? He said, I don't know. And he was asked, why? He said, because I begin counting when it begins to hurt. And I left with that wisdom. I said, the moment is uncomfortable. That's the time when it counts. Because everyone can push to the level of comfort. And I began to listen to guys because they said the secret of men are in their stories. And one of the patterns I discovered that laziness and creativity was, was out, out. That's why secular men take time to go for meditations. Some people go as far as India to San Gurus to meditate so that they say, you know, I want to decloud my mind. I want to clear and enter. And listen, you, you just need 30 minutes of tongues and worship and you disclutter the mind. And by the time you sit down, the things are oozing out. Let me tell you the truth. Your mind does not sleep. Your mind and your heart, they don't sleep. If your mind sleeps, you are dead. Because your mind has to control the nerves. That's why sometimes you wake up and turn. That's the mind telling the body. Umelala said, Moja sana, turn in Guinea. He's still awake. Hallelujah. Moja ya mkasubu yu kariya lezu ya mkumefesi said, no lalo. Why the mind <laughs> told the body, talk at your side and, and you insist on that side <laughs> So work your mind. Are you getting me? Work your mind. Work your mind. <sighs> so this is what the Bible says. Do not be conformed to this world. That is a conditioning of how people deal with. So I've mentioned the veil of the mind, right? The veil of the mind. That veil deals with perception and attitudes. How you view yourself, how you view life. There are people you just need to delete out of your company. They see possibilities. When you share an idea, they have never seen possibilities. You just tell them, this is what I'm thinking. And they're like, hey, you, hey, you, hey, you, you, hey, you, hey, you. Listen, from such men, run away. Men survive on inspiration. Someone said, you don't go where you are tolerated. You go where you are celebrated. I have a young girl and I've discovered when she begins to mood swing and she does not want to eat, my work is to clap and say, Mama, come, come, good girl, good girl. Open your mouth, good girl. Then she will open and eat. Why? Celebration. And that child is a potential <laughs> child who can sleep hungry. Because now mood swings. <laughs> and some of us, it's not that we don't have potential. Again, back to the GSU. So I asked them, they told me the, 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 the last phase is we go to Magadi for three months of training. Ask them, what kind of training? They said, in that area, you leave that area knowing it must be done. You don't leave that area saying we cannot do it. And in that area, they say sometimes they are trained and they stay awake for 22 hours. Because nobody sends you an SMS to tell you they are coming for war. War can happen anytime. Boom! And you never know how much those guys will stay sustained on their gun. One day, a friend of mine, he's a British soldier, he told me they were fighting in Afghan and they, they, they were eight of them, but they dealt with a hundred men. And those men were coming in shifts of ten. So what they wanted is by the time they are reaching the 50th, they are tired and they've run out of bullets. And they were eight men, high-ranking men. So these guys just wanted to kill the eight men and make a statement in British. And he said, sir, I understood when the Bible says that a man fought until the sword remained on the hand. <laughs> it's there. One of the mighty men of David. 
He stood in the field of lentils. He fought until the kisu ikakatalia kwa mkono. Ni vile amepigana. He said nili hiyo siku nilishoot. Mpaka kidole imekwamia kwa trigger. You know you see these things in movies. This a guy who was here on a Sunday. I, okay. <laughs> then you go back people coming from then you rest kidogo and they say these guys when they realize their men were losing because they dealt with almost 90 so the last 10 they were told come back and then all they were picked by a chopper <laughs> I was even told there is a language of sacrifice whereby you are trained that if you are eight of us and a man has a grunette you, 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 you can't lose the eight. One of you can sacrifice and die for the team. You have created a story of Kukufia team in the statement. You know, some of us, when we read these stories, we don't know war. Kutumiwa SMS mbaya na boyfriend. That is not war. Those are social matters. That, that is an insult to a man that has gone through barracks. And you tell him, Basini kana pitia wafe ya gani? Which one? A man is fighting mbaya kidole na kuambia kwa trigger. Uyo hata kuambia nini? <laughs> Because what I feel by the way is that the Lord is willing to do a lot with us. But we must take away the veil. Attitude and perception. You must stand and see yourself the way God sees you. God does not see you as a loser and a failure. Yesterday, I was listening to a preacher. And I got interested. I've never seen it that way. I've preached about David, but I've never seen it that way. You know, the story of David is a story of a boy. You remember when, when, when the father was asked, are these all the men? He said, there is yet still a small boy looking after the flock. Huh. Going through that story, I discovered David was the son of another woman. So the father presented the sons of the legal wife. And that's why he said there is yet still another. Because David was from another. <laughs> but when this boy is called and they say, possibly one of the reasons why he was told to go and look at the sheep. When you hear the story of killing a bear and a lion, it must have been a very serious forest. Maybe the father wanted him to die there so that he's not responsible of his death. Because even the sheep was looking after, they were very small. The brothers confirm in the story. And they say, where have you left the small flock? How do you risk small flock, small boy, in a forest that has lions and bears? What kind of father are you? And the big ones at home, but now studying the life of David, that is 16 year old, you already sense rejection, 16. He's anointed, kills Goliath. Then he goes to the house of Saul. And again, Saul, the man never had a father. Saul wants to be the father. But again, what the real father did is still what he does, rejects him. Every time David showed up, this is, what, this is what Saul used to say. My son, is that you? Meaning that David pursued Saul as a father. But irrespective of all these circumstances, the Bible says when he went in the cave of Adullam, the brothers came under his cover. And the men who came under that cover were the weak, the poor, and in debt. So, Kunatem family Lisota. And the only man that could deliver them was David. And when you read, when the anointing now fell, before the third anointing fell, the Bible says, and men came and gave themselves to David. Not to God, to David. And they said, we shall be your servants. They gave themselves. So by the time the man is 30 and is ruling, now after I read that story, I began to understand the Psalms of David. These are Psalms of a person that is rejected. Even when he's writing the stone that the builders rejected, he's in Psalms. Became the chief cornerstone. He suffered to the level that Christ identified with his suffering and it was lifted as prophecy. 
He even writes, I was, I was born in sin, conceived in iniquity. <laughs> oh God, you say I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. You knew me before my substance were yet formed. And all the days numbered were written. He writes and says, drunkards have found words to speak. And what they do, is they speak against me. When I show up in the place, even community rejects you. But, and that would have created a veil that I can never make it. But that man, God covenanted with him to be one of the leaders that ruled Israel. And God identified with that role. I was just reading that story. I said, that pattern was followed. Because again, the child of another woman is the one that became the king. Bathsheba. All the legal children of David never attracted the throne. Bathsheba is the one who gave birth to Solomon. And that child is the one who became the king. And the Jews hated Bathsheba so much that in the genealogy, they don't mention Bathsheba. They mention the woman who was the wife of Uriah. They mention Ruth and Rahab. But they ignore Bathsheba. Anyway. So I, I've begun to read the Psalms differently because I now I understand the pain and the sorrow of David. It was rejection. Hallelujah. And I began to understand assignment cannot be aborted because of rejection. Listen, as they pushed David away, that is when David got time with God. And that is why many possibilities were bathed in that area of pushing. Hallelujah. We have to take away the veil. There are things that God wants to do with us in time. And we must get out of normal thinking. This is my prayer to you. As I release you. Is that you will begin to operate with divine creativity. That the veil over your mind will be lifted. You will get out of coping and aping, looking at what is happening. And there will be confidence in things that are being bathed in your spirit. And I'm not talking about things bathed out of excitement. But things that you can look at, you can program, you can strategize, you can put systems on board. And then you'll know what will happen. Someone came and told me, I'm planning to bring this man of God in Kenya. I said, who? Me. I said, how? He said, pass his revival time. I said, I have no problem. He said, we are believing God, Kasarani will be full. I said, no problem. I said, the Holy Ghost moves, but the Holy Ghost does not move where there are no structures. He said, you can bring a man and organize an open air crusade and not a crusade. Why? Because you eliminated the place of thinking. And then now I sat down with men that pray. And we went for a breakfast meeting, planning for Thanksgiving for the nation. And they shared the vision. They met at the hotel from 11. They were leaving that place at 6, thinking. How do we do? How do we invite? What are the existing pastors' fellowship? How do we reach them? How do we reach young people, Pastor T? How do we get? How do we get? How, how, how? God has spoken to a thanksgiving. But God never said how we will do. Why? He knows we have something here. So we must think. Someone must come up with a budget. Someone must come up with a marketing strategy. Someone must come up with a mobilization strategy. What is that? Thinking. We don't come from the mountain and say, Mungu wale ambao the sheep know my voice. I tell you, speak to yourselves there. Hey, I know I'm talking to real Pentecostals. After saying amen, now say this is the thinking time. And think. And you don't think without writing. So you don't think without writing. 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 If it is not on paper, it's vapor. <laughs> Let me leave you with this one wisdom. Ordinary men always think about survival now ordinary men they are thinking how they will get supper those are ordinary men their greatest quote 
is a dead time. Ya kule leo nishibe kesho tajishughuliki. And it is not bad to live at a dead time until Jesus comes back. <laughs> Ordinary companies they are thinking about this month's rent. Go and look for extraordinary companies. They think 10 years and above. How many know Colgate? Yes? Si adona itishanga close up ya Colgate. Jo na jua dayote ameno ni Colgate. That company has lived 100 years. The founders of Colgate were a couple and they were born again. They bathed the idea in prayer. But after bathing it, they set structures that even at their death, the company grew and overgrew whatever they began. Can you be a Colgate founder that you can bath an idea? Today, Colgate is like a global name for toothpaste. Sato na jona nuanga Colgate Aquafresh. Yeah? Mtoto aki grow hivi, anajuanga dawa ya meno ni? They build a brand more than a hundred years. How they came with the chemicals, I don't know. But they have been improving their brand because you must think something that is beyond where you are now. If, if it's between your parameters of existence, you have not begun. You must think something that you will, something that will outgrow you. That generations to come the best thing you can do because of honor is sit in the board. Because they honor you. You sit in the board. But the thing you have built by the grace of God is bigger than you. And I'll encourage you to go and watch a message that was done by Miles Monroe before he died. It's called the power of passing on. And he said if you die with what you have, you do injustice to the next generation. And he said the greatest success is measured by the successor. If I die and there are stories of Zilez Kuzakinati, we have failed. Our days should be neutralized by the incoming generation because we are able to pass on, raise, and trust. Bonus if you will. Amen. That's why sometimes I always call my pastors to be aware who be real. End at midnight. Why? Because I want to enter my seventh day where I can delegate and focus on other matters. There are many. Mambo ni mengi. Let's stand up on our feet. Mood and your mchache. I just want you to make one prayer. In one minute, just tell the Lord, take away the veil over my mind. Bwana sifiwe. It is one thing to be born in a village. It's another thing to go through the motions of life, to go through rejection. It's another thing even to be uh, persecuted. The Bible says that Jephthah was a warrior. Uh, and, and but he was the child of a prostitute. His identity never made him to lose who he was. And so I want you just to pray this day. The veils must be lifted. We must enter. The Lord has delegated the affairs of the world. We are now dealing. We are in a generation of witty inventions. Men are creating things. There are levels of demonic inventions. We must arise and come up with kingdom proposals and kingdom ideas. Our people must come up with solutions in our day. Oh, anointed birth from the womb of the spirit and being ready to change and transform the way things are happening. We know that the end time church is a church that will carry the glory of El Elyon. We are partakers of that prophetic word and even today we want to declare that out of this, there are men rising with a supernatural pattern, supernatural thinking, ideas that are ordinary but extraordinary, thought patterns that are conceived from the womb of the spirit as you pray you will see patterns the bible says build according to the pattern may the lord begin to release patterns that are consistent to what you carry patterns that are going to be a solution and a form of deliverance upon your life let your conversation change let your crowd change any assassinator anyone released upon your life killers of destinies and visions killers men that rise with sounds of
of discouragement. May they live your life. May they live your life. Anyone planted in your circle to stand as a, a hither fell, to give counsel that is contrary to what the Lord has called you to do, we fire them now in the realm of the spirit. We call destiny help us. La paratosa kia pala. Le pamina compeletosa. La beza kota la paya. Lord, take away the veil. Take away the veil. This is not all that you can do. This is not all that is in you. You are God. Shata. Bekazo kataya. Let there be a release of boldness. A release of confidence. Let the supernatural mind. The Bible says, let this mind that was in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you. We are receiving a new mindset today. We are receiving new attitudes. We are receiving new perspectives of life. Shabakataya. Leperesodia. Every seed that is a negative seed. Seeds of mindsets and perception. <coughs> Let them be lifted in the name of Jesus. Shade palarosakataya. Deliver us, O Father, from mindsets that are not yours. Zilaba shandolo broske alaba. That is my prayer to you. Hallelujah. When I look at all of you, you have a great potential. Don't be afraid to think. Hallelujah. Feed your mind. Feed your mind. Buy books. We're in the age where people can learn a lot from this. A lot of tutorials are happening online. This is the age where you cannot have excuses. Amen. Where is the data flani? Yes. Or he's doing the setup for the Bible study. You know, that young man, Edith Aflani, he just cleared from four. He's not even two years old from form four. And he had such a desire to learn photography. Yes, come, sir. Let me, let me give you. You know, it's good to, you know, we quote Abraham from the Bible. I see it in the army. Talk of you out on a hairline. <laughs> this guy, he just began. After form four, he had interest. He even called himself Editor Flani. Even my wife was asking me, Editor Flani now. We to miss him, G, by the way. I thank you, Editor Flani. And he just developed interest. And guess what? Sometimes I find him here sleeping. Just learning on photography. And today, th there is a place where we did an advert for a corporate of IT. And the guy looked at it and said, wow, who is this guy? I, I couldn't give his profile. Now the Lord has opened a door. I just met someone in town. And he said, Ah, Pastor a blessing. Nene, nene. Mindo director, wa ichu. And he always wanted to do animations. And said, Mindo director, nanta kupe slot mote. I'm saying, Wacha. I told him, pursue that. Shang Tao. To go and do animation. I told him, now go and learn. But he never. <laughs> he never waited for that opportunity. He began to learn from online. I don't know what you're doing on TikTok. People are learning photography. And right now I can tell you, um, he's qualified even to run his own photographic and even editing. He is now doing music videos. Hallelujah. And he's the one who does the Bible study. For me, all the, all the Bible studies is in charge. And I trust him. I, I, a master's graduate. <laughs> At the masses of a form four. Akisema sound I don't know what to do. Why? Because now we are not just in the age of papers, we're in the age of knowledge. Bonus if you are. Please, where you are, put something. I don't know why I'm putting that emphasis. Where you are, put something. Buy a book. If you don't have a book, go online. There are online books. Begin to read. Put something. After three months, you'll discover you are speech. What you're doing is different. I met a man. People outside here are thinking, must. A friend of mine attended an alcoholic marketing company. Ni pastor, bishop in Thika. Akalipa ndege akenda sarova. Kuona how the marketers of this product are doing their stuff. Do you know what he came and told me? Ambia pasi, watu wata kunywa pombe. Kamuliza kwa nini? Akaniambia the kind of things these guys are thinking. And he told me, have you ever realized they never sell alcohol as something bad? There is one secular artist in Kenya who sings about alcohol more than anyone else. And he has never been made a brand ambassador. 
All his videos, he has alcohol. I'll not mention names. And he has never been named a brand ambassador. Yes? Yeah, a tumbler, eh? Now, this is the reason. That alcoholic company does not sell irresponsible drinking. That's why the people who take alcohol work on a masuti kwa advert. Now I'm talk a job. So it begins to condition your mind. Okay, Sela. God bless you. <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you, <laughs> the age we are living in, what wana fikiria. Bona sifiwe, you can't afford to be it. And we live in an age of wit invention. May God bless you and may God open up your mind. May God give you visions and dreams, ideas that are supernatural. May God give you something that will act as a tool of deliverance. It may be simple, but out of that simplicity, let the Lord be lifted. Let there be a change of how we view things. And let us not conform to the ways of the world. We'll look at that scripture in details. Hallelujah. Amen. Are you ready to give an offering? I have 25 minutes to go for Bible study. And today I'm beginning the hardest book. Are you ready to give an offering? Yes, yes. Hallelujah. I am to your offering, Lord. Go. I'm a mulitoa before the kuje. Pastor Ken. Anyway, it's time to give an offering. It's time to give an offering. These are the giving details: eighty-one seventy-three seventy and pesos seven two six seven one four seven one three. Father, we thank you, we honor you, and we declare even as we go back to our houses and our homes, we declare, oh Father, that indeed we are arriving home safely. May this conversation be something that will trigger something in us, oh God. There are many things that are happening. We are going back to the order and ordinance of the original mind. Creativity shall be our portion and divine ideas will be our portion. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just give me the offering back. Those who are giving, those are the details. Amen. God bless you. Amen. See you on Thursday. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Next week, Wednesday. Amen. God bless you. Come with me.